If you were debating with someone online and they gave you the link to this video, it's probably because you told them one of two lies. You either said that there's no evidence of evolution, or you said that there is evidence of creationism. This video, like most of my videos really, is meant to address creationists, those who reject evolution specifically and methodological naturalism in general, in favor of a faith-based belief in a story about a magical creation, wherein people have not evolved from apes like we know we did, but where the first man was instead created out of a clay figurine animated by a golem spell, and the first woman was created by the transformation of an extracted rib, and everything else was simply spoken into being out of nothing by an incantation, let there be, which I think translates to abracadabra. Now, we either base our beliefs on whatever the evidence indicates, in which case our position will obligately change according to our understanding, regardless of what some so-called authority says. Or, some people would rather bow to faith, usually in the assumption of authority, as if whatever the authority says is true simply because the authority says so. Evidence be damned. In the case of creationism, it is faith in an erroneous assumption of scriptural authority, as if all those obviously fictional fables are not merely man's word, but they're somehow God's word, as if the fables are real and objective reality is the fable, as if the scriptures are the only source of truth in our world, let all else be a lie, so that everything we can show to be true is a lie, and only the book of lies are true. Yeah, y'all got everything backwards because religion reverses everything. Now, consequently, every day, y'all comment on my videos posting paranoid accusations of secret associations or agendas or criticisms about what somebody thinks I'm implying, but that I never actually said or thought or meant. Or, some will post what they think is a challenge, but it's really just their basic misunderstanding of anything or everything. On average, I might waste as much as an hour every day trying to correct some anonymous internet nobody who really doesn't seem to know anything, nor do they even care what the truth is. And for what? Because the next day, I'll get the same sort of nonsense from another set of randos. So I may as well save all these responses to the last person and cut and paste them to the next person, since it's usually the same thing on an infinite repeating loop every day. In the last couple days, one commenter seemed determined to be wrong about everything she could be wrong about, and I did my best to reason with her. And to her credit, she actually admitted that, okay, I admit that this and this and that are all wrong, which is something creationists, to my experience, never do until she did. However, rather than straighten out from then on, she would always just start another list full of lies and nonsense for me to have to correct. And no one sees the admission of her earlier errors that I already corrected up to that point because she deleted the entire thread, and all that work just disappeared into the ether, totally wasted my time. So I decided that what I should do is, whenever appropriate, I could address these oft-repeated comments in video. Then people will see it. Even if they never know who the rando was, because that doesn't matter, they'll at least know the proper rebuttal to that criticism. For example, that person said that there was no evidence of evolution. Then I pointed out that she had posted that comment onto a video that was listing evidence of evolution. Did she not bother to watch it first before assuming what it did or didn't say? Then I reminded her that while we do have plenty of evidence for evolution, we have no, absolutely no, evidence for creation. I know some of you think you have examples that you're already typing into the comments. If that is true, why are there still apes? But hold on. Arguments are not evidence especially not when they're invalid. Hear me out. She replied, saying something to the effect that atheists always demand scientific evidence of creation, but then when we show it to them, they just ignore it. That pissed me off, because it bothers me when every one of your arguments is always just another lie, especially when you're the ones doing all the things you falsely accuse us of doing instead. It's all projection, the pot calling the silverware black. So I replied to her, explaining that believers tell me daily how they have scientific evidence to back their beliefs, but they never, ever present any. Again, I'm sure some of you are already typing what you think is evidence in the comments. You can't have a painting without a painter. But that isn't evidence. Just give me a minute. To make it more obvious that there is no evidence of creation. I've challenged a few of my recent debate opponents, especially those with science degrees, to show or cite anything they could think of 
that would actually qualify as evidence. And even though we're live on video with everyone watching, they always fail. Usually with the fallacious God of the gaps assumption that science can't explain blank. As if unexplained means explained by magic. The supernatural. Magical miracles, miraculous magic, the same thing. But by definition, the unexplained is not an explanation. If we had this discussion a couple hundred years ago before anyone figured out anything, whatever we didn't know then didn't count as evidence of creation then. So what little remains unexplained now still doesn't count as evidence of creation now. You're just shifting the burden of proof away from how your own assumed conclusion is indefensible. Really, you're demonstrating the circular reasoning of the question-begging fallacy, which is ubiquitous throughout all religions. It's the main fallacy that every faith is based on, immediately followed by arguments from ignorance and incredulity. Believers pretend as if the claim is evidence of itself, because God said so in the Bible, or the Quran, or the Bhagavad Gita, or the Book of Mormon, or whatever fractured fairy tale they've mistaken for the word of whatever God they want to imagine. There are so many supposedly holy books all claiming to be the absolute truth and the revealed word of the one true God, even though they can't agree which God that is, because every word of every religious doctrine was penned by men, not gods. And we know this because of all of the absurdities, atrocities, inconsistencies, contradictions, and prophecies that should have come true a long time ago, but that failed miserably, or spectacularly in some cases, proving that all the supposedly holy books of whatever gods are really just the words of mere fallible storytellers telling some tall-ass stories, but who obviously didn't really know what they were talking about. So don't even bother trying to cite your unholy fan fiction as if that was evidence. Because everything any of the scriptures says about gods or souls or the afterlife or any of that supernatural, spiritual woo, all of it, every such claim from every religion falls into one of two categories. It's either not evidently true, meaning that there's no reason to believe it, or it's evidently not true, meaning that we already know that it's false. But you know, I know, you're determined to believe it anyway. I know that deeply religious people tend to think in binary terms, where everything is us versus them, and there are only two extremes with nothing in between and no such thing as nuance or extenuating circumstances. But there are moderates here. Many of the pioneers and champions of evolutionary theory have been or are still Christian. They believe in God and accept evolution. You don't have evidence of God either, no matter what philosopher you care to point to. But even if you did, and even if you could prove that God really exists, it wouldn't prove that it was your God. And we're not arguing over some lofty philosophical speculation of deism. We're talking about scriptural literalism, science-denying religious extremist fundamentalism. So whether any God exists or not is largely irrelevant. Even if there really was a God, evolution would still be a demonstrable fact of population genetics, fossils, and phylogeny, and the doctrinal tomes of every religion would still be already falsified fables with little or no truth in them. You can protect your God by saying that he's supernatural, so we shouldn't expect to find evidence of him because he exists outside our reality, which logically means he does not exist in reality. But I'm not asking for evidence of God. I'm asking for evidence of creation, much of which you would have plenty of evidence for if that had really happened. But not only do you not have any evidence for creation, which should be enough to end the conversation right there, but it's even worse than that because there is substantial evidence against creation. Even Christian geneticists admit that nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution, that we have proof that we share a common ancestor with the other apes, and that the story of Adam and Eve is just a fable adapted from a number of earlier myths of elder polytheism in neighboring regions, and that there is not even a kernel of truth to that story. Similarly, anthropologists know that the Tower of Babel never happened, archaeologists know that the Exodus never happened, and we have plenty of proof in physics, genetics, geology, paleontology, zoology, and many other fields that the global flood of Noah's Ark never happened either. If it did, there would be evidence, mountains of it, everywhere. But there really isn't any anywhere. All there is is proof that it didn't happen. And some of you even pretend as if merely believing something is evidence that the belief is true, or that your subjective impressions or erroneous assumptions of misunderstood mistranslations are somehow justified by your intuition, no matter how often that psychic power turned out to be wrong when it can be tested at all. 
Y'all don't understand that subjective evidence is only evidence to the believer, not to me nor to anyone else. So the rest of us can't say that you have evidence, not when we all have our own subjective evidence to the contrary. If we both claim to know mutually exclusive opposite conclusions that can't both be true at the same time, then one of us is lying. And I think we both already know how to figure out which one that is. Evidence is commonly defined as a fact that indicates. So whatever your evidence is, at the very least, it has to be something we can both show to be true and real. That we can simply look it up and see that it is, in fact, a fact. If all you do is say, as so many do, that I'll know for a fact, and it's not a fact, meaning that it's not verifiably correct, then you just lied twice in one sentence. If, on the other hand, we can both confirm that what you said really is true, then it also has to indicate. If the same data would still be true in either of our mutually exclusive paradigms, then it's just a fact. It doesn't become evidence until it either indicates one conclusion or eliminates another. I have a long list of facts and evidence for evolution. For example, just to summarize some of that list, we have the fact that evolution happens, that biodiversity and complexity does increase, that, and that both occur naturally only by evolutionary mechanisms meaning that alleles vary with increasing distinction in reproductive populations and that these are accelerated in genetically isolated groups and that natural selection, sexual selection, and genetic drift have all been proven to have predictable effect in guiding this variance. Despite the believer's collective denial of reality, it is also a fact that significant beneficial mutations do occur and are inherited by descendant groups. And this has been verified in laboratory studies and there are multiple independent sets of biological markers tracing these lineages backwards over many generations. And I know the believers will just say, but that's only microevolution, which it isn't because microevolution is variation within a species, like you know, breeds of dogs, breeds of cattle, that sort of thing, while macroevolution is variation between species, at or above the species level, beginning with speciation. Now, a couple hundred years ago, creationists used to argue that new species could only come about as a special act of creation by God. But then Darwin explained the origin of species by means of natural selection. And now, creationists typically admit that speciation has been directly observed and documented dozens of times since then, both in the lab and in naturally controlled conditions in the field. So nowadays, creationists will even admit the macroevolution of new genera and new taxonomic families and beyond. They just don't want to call it what it is because they want to redefine macroevolution into a straw man parody of something the theory never proposed and doesn't even allow. There is no evidence anywhere in the world of any animal producing anything other than its kind. But even if you let them misdefine everything and call all of that microevolution, it's still evolution, which they say is impossible even when they admit that it happens. So we can actually watch evolution happening, but not creation. We've never seen even micro-creation, have we? I think this is about as close as we've ever come to that. So we have the question of why is there so much diversity among taxonomic orders, each divided into multiple families, each of which are themselves divided into multiple genera, each of which are subdivided into multiple species, wherein each continue subdividing to subspecies or breeds, as well as morphs, cultivars, and so on. Evolutionary processes explain all of that like literally nothing else does. The only creationist explanation is a process called PFM. Mixed with evolution because they know that evolution is real and that it really works. Even creationists have to cite evolutionary principles at some point, trying to justify, for example, how we get all this biodiversity from Noah's Ark, where they have to hyper-accelerate the evolutionary processes. But there's some other mysterious point in the murky past where you all got to pretend that it doesn't work anymore, though you can never say when or why, and you can never provide any evidence of that. If you all have evidence of that, then someone would have answered the phylogeny challenge in the decade or so since I posted it, but none of you could even figure out what the question was. So you don't have any evidence for creation precisely where it would have been if there was any truth to your belief. But we still have plenty of evidence for evolution that I haven't even mentioned yet. Like the fact that birds are a subset of dinosaurs. That's another fact that creationists habitually lie about. I don't even try to argue here that birds are not dinosaurs because I've already proven that point conclusively in another playlist, and I'll put the link to that below. You're not winning that one. It's settled science. And these facts are not only indicative of evolution, they're also exclusively concordant with evolution, like the fact that humans are a subset of apes, primates, eutherian mammals, and vertebrate deuterostome animals, 
where we would not be any of those if we were magically animated mud golems like the superstitious mystics like to pretend. It doesn't work to say that you didn't come from apes when your mama was an ape and so are you still. Learn what those words mean. A taxonomy is not some arbitrary construct of human imagination like God and creation both are. This is an objectively verifiable fact of genetics that was first recognized by a Christian creationist a century before Darwin and a couple centuries before the discovery of fossil hominids, even before anyone understood what fossils really were. Carolus Linnaeus knew that humans were a subset of apes way back in 1735, just based on morphology alone. Then there's the fact that it's not just humans. The collective genome of all animals has been traced to its most basal form, and those various forms are also indicated by comparative morphology, physiology, and embryological development. Because every animal on Earth has definite relatives either living nearby or evident in the fossil record. And there's the fact that the fossil record holds hundreds of transitional intermediate forms, even according to the strictest definition of that term, and that's just among vertebrates. There are thousands if you include the invertebrates. And yes, the many means of radiometrically dating these fossils is a fact too. Though the ages they give are within a range, they are also absolute. Creationists will lie about all of that too, knowing that they're lying because accuracy, honesty, accountability, and reality don't even matter to the wanna believers and defenders of the faith who just want to make believe in their favorite fairy tale and cling to their magic imaginary friend. Your denial of every inconvenient truth doesn't matter in this video. I just wanted to list some of the facts and evidence for evolution, and I feel perfectly safe in predicting that none of you will ever be able to cite even one actual fact that either indicates creation or that contradicts evolution of what evolution actually teaches. Because what I usually see instead is the straw man fallacy of attacking some made up distortion, something the theory doesn't even say or it doesn't even allow. Like, for example, no one has ever seen a horse produce an on horse or a bird produce anything but another bird. Not only does evolution not teach that one kind of thing ever turned into another fundamentally different kind, it doesn't even allow that because one, that would violate two of the natural laws of evolution and two, there's no such thing as a kind because kind is undefined, which means that it doesn't mean anything. And understand that in my extensive experience of arguing with dogmatic wanna believers every single day for the last quarter century or so, while many of you pretend, yes, pretend, as if you have evidence, no creationist has ever presented anything other than frauds, falsehoods, and fallacies, which y'all have in abundance. Every claim of evidence is either not verifiably true, or it still wouldn't be indicative even if it was true, or, and this is the most common condition, it fails both criteria, being neither true nor indicative. And I should add that the best scientific evidence would come in the form of articles published to mainstream peer-reviewed scientific journals. And ideally, other scientists should have already acknowledged that said study does indeed say or imply whatever the creationist imagines that it does. But every single time I've ever read any such cited study, it always turns out that no other scientist thought that it said or implied what the creationist said it did. Never once. Usually the opposite. So if you cite a study, read it first. Now, if you're confident that you're going to be the one, the first creationist to break this decades-long trend and actually produce evidence of creation that you've all been claiming you've had all along, then get your typing fingers ready to scratch your heads when you realize you can't even think of one single thing that we can both confirm to be actually factually true and that is also indicative of your insincerely held game of make-believe.
The only creation for that is a process called PFM. He's a big doggy. Get your face out of there. Okay, go lay down. Go lay down. I'm recording. Go lay down. Go lay down. Go lay down. <sighs> Hi. I love you too. Now go lay down. Go. Go, 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 go. Okay.